The Lord be with you. First, let me say I heard I have heard uh, what a uh, an outstanding job Victoria did last week, and let me um, thank you for welcoming her. And I, I've already sort of chastised her by email not to sing next time, because <laughs> then the expectations come, and then they'll be waiting for me to sing, and then you'll all realize what a a, a, a bum deal you got. And so. Uh, but also, uh, let me, all, uh, as you're turning in your Bible to the 17th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, let me also invite you back. Uh, Nikki mentioned Wednesday night uh, here in the sanctuary after supper uh, will be our Ash Wednesday service. Ash Wednesday is the beginning of the season of Lent, a time of reflection, a time of fasting. Traditionally, uh, in the ancient church, Lent was a time of preparation prior to Easter and to one's baptism. Uh, but we use it now as a season of reflection and preparation for Lent and so, or for Easter. So I invite you to be here not just this Wednesday night, but everyone hereafter as we uh, walk our way towards the cross. And that will be reflected also here uh, in worship for Lent as well as pyramids go from green to purple and some other Lenten things happen. So we're in 17th chapter of Matthew's Gospel on this Transfiguration Sunday, verses 1 through 9 there. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish... I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them saying, Get up, and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, in this time as we listen for your words from Holy Scripture, we pray for open ears. Open ears that may hear your voice. Open eyes that may see the way you call us. Open hearts, Lord, that we may receive the love you have for us that calls us ever on and empowers us to do what you call us to do. So Lord, be with us. Speak to us. Shape us more and more into the likeness of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, by now I hope you know I like stories. Uh, I particularly like short stories Uh, One, because my attention span and time is so short these days, it's a lot easier to just commit to one story rather than uh, several chapters. I like short stories because they're sort of like Polaroids of the human existence. They can't give you the whole story, just, just one little snapshot. This is grief. This is pain. This is joy. This is heartbreak. But I also like novels series of novels. A novel or a book series can, can capture in amazing ways almost the whole of human existence. Whether it's through stories about fanciful creatures like hobbits and wizards and elves, whether it's stories about a boy wizard, or stories grounded in American fiction like the time during the Great Depression. 
I love those stories. And one of my favorites is the one about the Hobbit, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings series. Uh, Peter Jackson did a pretty good job uh, rendering it on film. I think he went too far with The Hobbit, but that's my own opinion. Uh, but if you've never read the books, you should, you should. And if you haven't watched the movies, uh, you can borrow mine. I have the Director's Cuts DVDs. Each movie's about six hours long, so, you know, commit some time to that. But one of the things that I love about, all, uh, about that story is, if you don't know about it, there's a hobbit named Frodo, so, you know, real good stuff. Uh, he finds a ring, and this ring is sort of the, the embodiment of, the, of evil. It's indwelt by uh, a spirit named Saron, who is the, sort of the epitome of evil. And in order to get rid of him, he has to go from his quiet, quaint little village called the Shire all the way to this dark, dangerous place called Mordor and throw it into a mountain so it'll burn up in the volcanic magma at its heart. So he's going along and there are all kinds of scary little things along the way. But early on in the story, Frodo and his hobbit friends are in this place called Rivendell which is a, a nice, quiet... All these elves live there, and the elves, man, are all supermodels, apparently. Very tall, straight hair, elegant people. Even the sunlight in Rivendell isn't harsh. It's like the muted mid-morning light that comes through someone's window. And every time I read that book or, or watch the movie, you know the first thing I think when they wake up and it looks so nice and it sounds so great on the page, the first thing I think, stay there, you dummy! Stay there! There no, there's no evil there. The elves even make it sound like they can't get in. Stay there. Let the rest of the world worry about the evil rings. Throw that ring out of the woods and don't worry about it anymore. Just stay there. That's what I do. That's what I do. Or, or in the, the Harry Potter series. Now, I, I'll admit to you, I haven't read all the books because they started getting thick. And so I started watching the movies. And there's a scene towards the end of that series where Harry and Hermione, his friend, are running. They're on this journey looking for these things called horcruxes. Again, you can tell I read very educated literature. <laughs> and, and in the midst of all of this, they have to escape, and they find themselves in this wintry wood. Nice little creek, snow on the ground, nice warm fire, big magical tent that goes on forever. And they start having this conversation. Let's just stay here and grow old here. And every time I hear that, every time I see it, I go, yeah, stay there. Stay there. Uh, history is cyclical. Evil will come. Somebody will raise up and smack them down. You don't have to be the person. You've got enough on you. Just stay there. Stay there in the woods where it's nice. You've got magic. You've got a tent. You've got a fire. Stay there. Stay there. Or what is my all-time favorite novel? John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. The Jodes are forced out of their home in Oklahoma. The Dust Bowl has come in. Tractors are plowing everything down, and they've got to go west. People die from exposure and starvation. The overloaded Ford they have can barely crank it across a U.S. 66. And they come to a place on their journey, a government camp. It's nice. They're given a lot, a home, water piped right up to a spigot. They never had it before. Clean bathrooms, plenty of food to eat. There are even dances. And I think, just stay there. Don't go on to California. You still got to cross stuff. You still got to deal with things. Ma is old. Pa is old. That old Ford is a beat up jalopy. It's not going to make it. Just stay there. I say it to the page as I read it. Stay there. Just stay there. It's nice. Maybe not a lot of Baptists since they're dancing, but they can be there. Stay there. Stay there. I have to admit to you, I have the same, the same thought this Sunday every year when I read this passage. The transfiguration. If you read the gospel, it, it's like a long journey. It's like all these other stories. Starts out in one place. We know where it's going to go. We've had 2,000 years to be told. We know where the story's going. We know what's happened up to this point. We know what Jesus has said. We know what people have done. We know how they've treated his followers. 
And then, then in the middle of the story, Jesus looks at Peter, says, All right, Pete, you, James, and John, just you three, we're going up a mountain. They go up the mountain, and they're there. And Jesus, Jesus turns into somebody from a toothpaste and bleach commercial. It's dazzling white. He's shimmering. He's sparkling. Moses and Elijah are there. Don't know how they knew it was them, but there they are. Moses and Elijah. And I, I, man, I echo Peter. Lord, it is good for us to be here. It's good. I mean, down there, down there, you remember what we had to do? I mean, yeah, Jesus fed 5,000. Matthew, he fed 5 and 4,000. But you know, they're always going to be there. Jesus even says it himself, the poor you'll always have with you. They're going to come. The hungry are always hungry. They'll come with their mouths open and their stomachs grumbling. Jesus, it's good for us to be here. The poor you'll always have. They'll come with their hand out, wanting more, needing help. But it's good for us to be here. Oh, blessed are you when you were persecuted. They're talking about us down there, Jesus, but it's good for us to be here. Down there, the lepers and the sick folks were healing, and there are always going to be more of them, and there are always going to be things to do. But here, it is good for us to be here. Can I build some tents? That's what he said. I'll make three of them, one for you. One for Moses, one for Elijah. There also happen to be three of them. I have a feeling if Jesus said, yeah, Pete, go ahead, uh, set up the tents, we'll stay here. If he said, well, while I'm doing that, can I make one for me and one for James and one for John? It is good for us to be here. It happens. It's not just in novels and not just in Scripture. There are plot times and, and places in our lives where we want to say it's good to be here. I can tell you one from my own life. It was almost 11 years ago now. Sally and I had just gotten married. We drove up to North Carolina, just outside of Asheville, stayed in a little cabin, a little place called Banner Elk. Maybe some of you have been there. Little cabin, nice, had a long porch on the back, rocking chairs. A little creek ran behind the cabin. I remember one morning, I didn't drink coffee yet, so I had a glass of juice. I had not been saved, I guess. Um, I had a little glass of juice. Maybe my Bible, maybe not, I don't know. But I was sitting on that rocking chair and listening to the creek, listening to whatever critters were up that hour of the morning, and I thought to myself, man, I wish we could just stay here. Just stay here. Oh, I know, we got to go home. I know to go back home means that Sally's going to have her wisdom teeth taken out that week. I know to go back home means that I got to go to work in a cabinet shop for a couple of weeks. And then we're going to move to Waco, Texas, where we don't know anybody. And they don't have pork barbecue. And where, where we don't have any friends. And we don't have a job. And we're going to stay in some old ratty apartment. So can I just stay here for right now? Just here. No, no worries. Just the sound of the creek. And the sound of the rocking chair on that old porch. Can I just stay here? We get in those places in life. Things seem like they can't get any better. Can we just stay right here? But we know. We know the sun goes down. And it comes back up again the next day. But I know something from Scripture that's proven true in my life, and I'm sure it has in yours. Every single time that I have said, I just want to stay right here. Every single time that I have said, this is what I want. This is perfect. Don't move anything. Let's stay right here. Every single time the voice of God interrupts. Every time. Do you notice that's what happened here? Peter says, Lord, let us build. Is it okay? Can I build three chapels, three tents, three tabernacles right here for you, Moses, and Elijah? Jesus doesn't even get to tell him no. What happens? Cloud descends. A great voice comes out. This is my son, the beloved. With him, I am well pleased. And then it says, they fell to the ground because they were afraid. But you know... I don't think it was the cloud that scared them. I don't think it was the voice that scared them. There's another place where the same voice says the same thing. 
there by the waters of the Jordan. This is my son, the beloved, with who I am well pleased. Do you know what I think scared them? The last sentence from the voice. Listen to him. Because I'll tell you what, it scares me. Another way to translate that is, do what he says. Can I tell you all something right now? I don't want to do what Jesus says. I don't. I kind of doubt you do, but maybe you're a better person than I am. Some of you are, I know. I don't want to do what Jesus says. I mean, I've looked back, and now my, my Bible doesn't have red letters, but maybe yours does. And I've read some of the things that Jesus says, and I'm going to tell you folks, I don't want to do them. Do you know he says... He says one time, give to whoever asks. Did you know that? He doesn't say, comma, make sure they're blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. Give to whoever asks. In another place, you know what he says? He says, if somebody takes your jacket, he doesn't say, uh, call the police. He says, give them your shirt. But it's enough to give them a jacket. I, I mean, it's cold. I, sure. Give them your shirt. He says that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do I don't want to give my jacket. I don't want to do that. He says, if somebody makes you go a mile, not if somebody says, hey, man, you want to tag on with me for a while? Do you want to walk around the track a couple times? No. If somebody makes you go a mile with the implication you're carrying their junk for them, do you know what he says? Go another one. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to listen to what he says. The one that really gets me, though, he says, somebody strikes you on your cheek. Does he say, bow up back at them? Does he say, you know, get, you, get your hands up because they might hit you again? What does he say? Turn your right cheek, the other cheek. Because the right one, do you know how you got to get hit on your right cheek? Either by the back of your right hand or the front of your unclean left hand. I'll let you, your imagination decide what they did with their left hand back in the day. That's what he said. I won't do that. I don't want to do that. And then, then the one I think that really encompasses them all, the one that, that just I just I can't listen to it. Deny yourself and take up your cross. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. You better believe I'm gonna be afraid like they are. This is my son. Yeah, we saw him, God. He was shiny, dazzling. We saw him. Oh, man, he looked like Rabbi Fabio right there. Oh, man, there he is. He's wonderful. Listen to him. Oh, I don't want to do that. No, let's just stay here. If I were Peter, and thank God that I was not one of his disciples, because y'all have been reading about me going, that man is ridiculous. I'd have said, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to stay up here. Y'all go on down. I'm going to stay right here. I want to listen to him. I don't want to listen to Jesus. Jesus asks too much. Jesus asks hard and impossible things. I don't want to listen to Jesus. Because I know, too, I'll never get it right. I know I can't do it all. I mean, I'm standing up here wearing a coat. Somebody tried to take it. I'm, I don't think I'll give it to them. I'm not going to do it right. I know. I think, I think that's why we're told that they were afraid. When they heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But, that's a wonderful word, by the way, in Scripture. Jesus came and touched them. Jesus came and touched them, and he said, get up and stop being afraid. That's a better way to translate it. Not get up and fear not, don't be afraid. Stop being afraid. If there's ever a word we need to hear, it's that. Get up and stop being afraid. That's what he said. And they get up. And they know. I mean, just a few more verses. If you read it, there's a conversation about Elijah. Now, now we can get into verse 9 and the whole messianic secret. What does Jesus mean? Don't tell them. I don't know. I mean, there are people who write Ph.D. dissertations on that, and they still don't know. But he says it. They have this whole conversation about Elijah. But Jesus, I, I imagine they're not even without, beyond eyesight of the place where they just saw this transfiguration. And Jesus says in verse 12, 
about Elijah, about John. They did to him whatever they pleased, so also the Son of Man is about to suffer at their hand. That's it, I'm out. You going back down the mountain, Jesus? This was fun. I'm going back to Galilee. Suffer? At the hands of those people? No, no, no. But they go. I think, I think the reason for the transfiguration, the whole reason we even mark it on the church calendar, the reason Christ did it. Because, I mean, if you think about it, what's the point of teasing the disciples about the glory of God wrapped in the flesh of Christ? I think it's to remind us that the one we are called to listen to is God. The one we are called to do what he says is God. Not some fanciful made-up person. It is God incarnate calling us ever on, saying, get up and stop being afraid. Get up and stop being scared. What are we scared of? I don't know. You may be scared of something I'm not scared of. I may be scared of things you're not scared of. But I do know one thing. I do know one thing. I think we're all, at our very core, sometimes frightened to do. Listen to him. And Jesus touched us and said, Get up and stop being afraid. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us, Lord, when we are afraid. Have mercy on us, Lord, when we don't want to do what you say, when we don't want to listen. Have mercy on me, God. But Lord, I know I don't want to listen. Give us the strength, Lord, to be your disciples who listen to what you say. Do what you call us to do. Help us to have the strength to get up and stop being afraid. Holy Spirit, be with us as we listen for your moving. We sense where you may be calling us, what, to what you may be calling us. And Lord, give us the courage to get up, to listen to you, and to not be afraid. In your holy name we pray.